If you're not sure what type of mountain bike to buy, then a trail bike is the best place to start. And actually, in my eyes, is the best representation of what the modern day mountain bike actually is. Although the trail hardtails are great, it's the full suspension bikes I'm talking about. Whereas cross country, downhill, and even enduro bikes have to compromise in some areas to actually be brilliant for their true intention, the trail bike is the best all round compromise in terms of structure, geometry, performance on the trail, and in this case, price as well. So let's have a look at the modern day trail bike. Vitus has sent me their brand new Mythic bike, actually for a video I've just made over on GMBN about the evolution of the modern day trail bike and how that stemmed from the evolution of the trail center. Uh, check it out, the video's down there somewhere. A little bit different from the content I usually make here on tech, so I'd like to know what you think of it. Today though, is all about the tech that's on modern day trail bikes. Uh, I must say thank you though uh, to Cordy Brennan and Natural Resource Wales for helping us out with this trip. And in particular, the MTB Ranger. Thank you, Andy, for showing us some of these amazing spots you got tucked away here out in the hills around Cordy Brennan. For today's video, I've chosen to use the Vitus Mythique because this is a brand new trail bike. There's four models available in a range and this could well be a great option for people out there watching this video. Now, within the range, you've got two different travel options. You've got 130 millimeters and 140 millimeters, and you have two different wheel size options across those four models. So the first model is the VR, and it's available with 130 mil travel at both ends and the two different wheel sizes. Then you've got the VRS, which is jumped up to 140 mil at both ends, and you've got the choice of two different wheel sizes. You've got the VRX, both wheel sizes in 140 mil travel, and this one, which is the top of the range model. So this one is the AMP or the AMP. Uh, it has 29 inch wheels, front and rear only, 140 mil travel, front and rear only, and it retails for 2,399 pounds here in the UK. <laughs> yeah, that's the top of the range model. Mad, isn't it? Okay, quick rundown on here. So you've got a mixture of Shimano componentry, you've got race face cranks, and you've got a 12 speed setup, one by, uh, with a mixture of SLX, XT, and Dior. You've got SLX brakes on here, nuke proof cockpit, pike fork on the front, deluxe shock on the rear. Uh, the pedals are my own pedals, and mudguard is my own just for the weather conditions. But it does come with a swirl bear rubber front and rear setup tubeless on WTB wheels. All actually really good stuff, no issues with it. But the most important thing to underline here is the frame itself. Now the frame is the same model across all four models here. So this is the most important thing. Now it can be very easy to buy a cheap frame and hang loads of expensive components off it. And at a glance, everyone's like, oh, that's a nice bike. But really, you've kind of done it wrong. What you need to start with is a really good frame. And the rest of it, don't forget, like a lot of the stuff is actually consumable parts. So your chain, your cassette, your derailleurs, your tires, all these things are gonna wear out as you use them anyway. So it doesn't matter if you start with top ones or low end ones, because you can, you can buy better ones over the time. The frame is the key here. Now, what I'm talking about with a quality frame is decent geometry on the frame, something that's future-proof, something that's relevant for what the bike is supposed to be, decent suspension, kinematics, and features like replaceable bearings, and things like the SRAM UDH hanger on the back, all sort of future-proofing things to be able to look after your purchase. Okay, with all the glittery stuff out of the way, let's focus on the frame, because this is what you wanna be considering when you're buying a bike. That is the most important thing to get right in your purchase. Now, this one is a Vitus Mythic. It's made from 6061. T6 aluminium, and yes, Vitas have had a bike in their range called the Mythic before, and it was a trail bike, but they're two very different bikes. So this one really is a line in the sand for the brand at the moment, and it shares much more in common, I think, with their uh, slightly burlier bikes they've got in the range, the Escarp and the Summit, which are quite a lot more high-end as well, so it's a really good thing for this. Now, I actually made a video for GMBN trying to find out how they design and develop bikes, and I wrote a prototype of an Escarp, and when I was in the office, I saw a bike that was unmarked, which turns out to be a prototype of this that was lent up in the office. Now, they didn't really tell me much about it at the time, but a bit later on, I saw the prototype or the working prototype when I was at Sea Otter 
earlier this year. So it's really quite cool. So I've seen not only the previous bike as a prototype, I've seen this one in all the stages through to now. And it's really cool to see the finished piece. Okay, so you've got a redesigned seat tube on here so you can run the maximum length dropper posts per size frame. Uh, a very cool feature I've noticed down here, it's got a bridgeless seat stay design on this. That means they've designed the frame to be strong and stiff enough to not need one, but it also means that you have an almost an infinite amount of mud clearance. That is brilliant for riding in places like this around the UK. You've got double row bearings on the back end here. You've got frame silencers built in. You've got protection on the down tube, a boost back end on here. And something I really quite like on this is external cable routing. Yeah, okay, so internal cable routing does look better if you do it right. It can look really neat and tidy on the frame, but all too often you can just have entry and exit points and the cable rattles around on the inside, or even worse, it could be one of those ones that just takes forever to set up. This just works. You've got nice clean routing, nice clean cable clips built onto the frame there, easy access, easy for maintenance, and it looks great. And actually, I wish some other designers would have the guts to just stick to running external routing. Now, this bike's got the classic four bar suspension system. You can identify a four bar bike by seeing this pivot down here on the chainstay, and that basically separates between the main pivot and the rear wheel axle. Uh, if that pivot is on the seat stay, that would make it a single pivot with some sort of linkage to drive the shock. But in this case, it's a true four bar. It also has the trunnion mount for the shock. Now that's something you don't really see on that many entry level bikes. You tend to see it on slightly more expensive bikes. And it means you can do away with the DU bushing that you get on the shock there, which means you've got incredibly sensitive performance. Uh, and I can test, it gives you a lot of traction when you're riding. It feels really good. And I love the fact that you typically see that on higher end bikes. Now something else really cool about this is it shares all the same pivots and bearings and hardware on the frame as the more expensive Summit and the Scarp bikes in the range, which is great. It just means it's a bit more future-proof purchase. <laughs> and a bit about the geometry on the bike. So up front you have a 65 and a half degree head angle, which is absolutely perfect for a trail bike. 77 and a half degree seat angle, positioning you basically over the BB between your two wheels for climbing. 445 mil chain stays, and a reach that tops out at 510 millimeters on the largest, which is this bike, the size XL. Now, some people might like a longer bike, but actually in terms of trail bikes, you've got to strike the balance between fit and actually the flexibility and agility when riding. That's a great size for this sort of bike. Now, something else to suggest as well is that this bike could well be a great entry point but it shouldn't be treated like a budget bike. This is a high performance bike, just happens to be really great value for money. Okay, so let's just clear up a few things first with cross country bikes, trail bikes, and enduro bikes in terms of the wheel travel because let's face it, you've probably been considering bikes like those as well. Now for argument's sake, cross country bikes, 100 to 120 more travel, trail bikes, 130 to 150, enduro bikes, 160 to 180. Now, one of the things I always hear people say about justifying an enduro bike is, oh, they climb so well. And the other one they say is, oh, you know, I want the enduro bike because they go downhill so well. And I guess you could say they are true statements within reason. So you've got to bear in mind that enduro bikes are designed to climb up to the top in order to come down as fast as possible. And they achieve this with clever suspension designs, features like low speed compression on the shocks, lockout levers, sometimes handlebar mounted lockout levers, and in some extreme cases, bikes that have like adjustable travel from the handlebars and things like that. But you've got to bear in mind, they're not natural climbers. However, pointing them downhill, no doubt about it, an enduro bike will cover ground extremely quickly. But if you're the sort of rider that's like a passenger rather than a pilot, you're running the risk of the bike just feeling lethargic and just not very good, if I'm completely honest. If you're running flatter terrain or technical terrain like this, where you've got to really move the bike around, perhaps undulating terrain, then the bike can feel just a bit sluggish and, dare I say, boring. And then with cross-country bikes, 
It can actually be the complete opposite problem. If you're descending something that's a little bit more technical, it can often turn into crisis management just to stay rubber side down. Now, what you achieve with a trail bike is it takes the best elements of cross country and enduro bikes. You've got a bike that's lighter and more responsive, but it can handle almost anything you throw at it without the sort of flaws that you can get with the enduro bike. Trail bike is the king. So in terms of assistance for climbing on this trail bike, the designers have put 100% anti-squat into the back end. So when I'm in the lowest gears, the bike does not bob around at all. It's just got so much support for climbing. But then it tails off when you go into the higher gears for building up speed again. And so when you start going down the block into the higher gears, the anti-squat is then reduced to 80%. So what that effectively means is anti-squat can stop the shock being so sensitive. So great for climbing, not so great for descending. So by having it reduced in your higher gears, which you're more likely to be going a lot faster, your suspension remains really active. Now, this shock on here is actually quite a basic model. It doesn't even have a climb switch on it. And not once have I felt like I needed it. It's got really good support on the back end of this bike. Okay, I can hear some of you saying, yeah, but my enduro bike's got loads of anti-squat as well. All right, so yes, enduro bikes do also have anti-squat for the same reasons. However, you tend to find that the anti-squat on enduro bikes will be slightly less. And the reason for this is that enduro bikes favor a bias to bump absorption over anything else. Those bikes are designed to truck it over rough terrain. So they'll never be quite as good as climbing as their trail brothers. And the opposite can be said with cross-country bikes. Those bikes favor all of your pedaling output transferring into you going forwards over the grip and the comfort from the suspension. Again, another reason why I think the trail bike is the ultimate modern day mountain bike. Okay, so let's talk about geometry then because three types of bike here on the table and I'm trying to tell you that this is the best all-rounder as a mountain bike. So we generally know that having a bike that fits you correctly with geometry that's appropriate to what you're doing is gonna give you the best comfort, the best control, and actually the best experience when you're riding. Now, cross-country bikes tend to have steeper geometry, and enduro bikes tend to have much slacker and longer geometry, right? So, an example of a slack head angle, 63, 64 degrees. Yeah, that's gonna feel incredible when you're slamming this thing down through the roughest, steepest trails. But as soon as you're on more basic trails, flatter trails, slower trails, or climbs, the bike's gonna feel really quite lethargic. Now, if you flip this to the opposite end of the spectrum with the steeper head angles you see on 100 mil bikes, it's not a problem on a bike with 100 mil travel when you ride it appropriately. But if you were to have a head angle from one of those style bikes on a bike like this, that's got much more intention and much more capability, you're gonna find yourself in situations where the bike feels quite nervous. Now, this trail bike has got 65 and a half at the front, nearly 78 on the seat angle there, and a reach that's not far off most modern enduro bikes, slightly longer chain stays give more climbing performance and a steeper head angle returns the agility that long bikes can lose out on. So enduro race bikes tend to have stems that can be as short as 30 millimeters. Uh, they'll definitely be sub 50 millimeters on the bikes. And most racers tend to have the bikes pretty much as long as they can. Now this will depend on the preference of the racer, but the theory is the longer the bike is, the better it's gonna handle when you get them up to speed through the rough. That long wheelbase retains immense stability. Now this isn't always the case. This is just a general statement about enduro bikes. When you flip this and you look at cross country bikes, they, although the bikes have progressed and they are getting longer, they still tend to be very long and using stems on the shorter side, around 70 mil, but often as long as 100 millimeters on the bikes. Now the trail bike like this, it's got 45 millimeter stem and it sits firmly in the middle, but it's got plenty of length in that top tube, plenty of length on that front center there. So that reach measurement is quite crucial in terms of how your bike handles when you stood out the saddle. You make a bike too long, it becomes a handful unless you're tanking at the speed. Make a bike a bit on the short side, then your body weight is gonna act a bit more like a pendulum on the bike. And you're gonna have to be moving your weight really far forwards and backwards a lot of the time. As you've seen with a lot of the riding in this video, you're moving around, not so much on the bike, but the bike is moving around everywhere on the trail. So it's all about having the most efficient position. Again, the trail bike is the key for almost anything you're likely to encounter on the trails.
We've been here in Coyote Brennan in North Wales for the last couple of days riding and filming. And actually, the cool thing about this is the trail bike movement technically happened here because the first trail center happened just over there, the first official mountain bike trail. And once that was built, it started developing what people were doing on bikes. And then of course, bike manufacturers had to start changing the way the bikes were developed accordingly. And therefore it makes a great place to discuss bikes like this. Now, I think the trail bike is king. So if you're the sort of mountain biker that heads out at weekends for a ride with your mates, maybe you like a, a bit of an uphill challenge, smash your mates to bits on the descents, perhaps you like the odd uplift day or uh, an overseas trip once a year, then I think the trail bike could be the perfect bike for most people. Certainly, if you're looking to buy a mountain bike, this is where you should start forming your opinions on what's gonna be good for you. Um, if I could only have one bike, a trail bike would definitely be the bike I would have. Uh, but I'd love to know, uh, what sort of bike do you have? Do you have many bikes? What sort of styles of bikes do you have? And if you can have more than one bike, what would you have and why? Uh, let us know in the comments underneath and we'll see you in another video soon on tech. In the meantime, I'm gonna watch the planes that are about to go over my shoulder in a Mac loop.